And as soon as uh, I started with CVA, that's when everything started to transition over. And CVA was getting more and more into uh, the modern, more modern style inlines. Listening to the Muzzle Loaders Podcast, the show where we talk about anything and everything black powder. How's it going, guys? It's Darren with muzzleloaders.com, and you're listening to the Muzzle Loaders Podcast. And I'm really excited. We are out here in Lawrenceville, Georgia, at the BPI facility. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to sit down with uh, Dudley McGarity, and we're going to be talking about the history of CVA uh, as well as a whole bunch of other stuff. We were just talking about hunts here a few minutes ago. So uh, stay tuned for that action. And Dudley, how are you doing today? Doing great. Good. I'm glad that we had an opportunity. Our paths crossed. You were running around here with boxes in hand and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, I've uh, I, I did some gun testing over the weekend, so I was bringing those back in. So still have my finger on a lot of this stuff. And yeah. even though I've been semi-retired for a number of years. Yes. Yes. And I guess for those that aren't aware, what has your role been, and what does your role look like now with with BPI? Well, I started with B, with. Um, what was the predecessor of BPI when Connecticut Valley Arms was uh, a company Mm -hmm. rather than a brand back in 1995. Okay. And I'd been big into muzzle loading, just that was part of my uh, hunting activities, and I thought it would be fantastic to work for a muzzle loading company. So that's how I got into it. And then in 1999, the uh, BPI was formed. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, ever since then, we've been uh, growing into really a multiple brand company, what we would call a house of brands. Mm -hmm. So we have quite a few different brands underneath the uh, BPI umbrella now. Got it. So was because BPI is under DCAR as well, right? Well, DCAR is the is our manufacturing partner in Spain, Mm -hmm. and they actually bought. Connecticut Valley Arms Incorporated, okay, and then re- reincorporated it as uh, BPI Outdoors or Black Powder Products Incorporated. Got it. And so, in Connecticut Valley Arms is CVA for those of you the guys that aren't Correct. aware. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would get so, a lot of people ask about that. It's like I have a Connecticut Valley Arms. What is that? I have no idea what it stands for. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. was, but but yes, the company originated in 1971 in uh, Connecticut. Okay. So that's where the name comes from. And then in a, in the mid-80s, uh, the then owners uh, moved it to uh, first to Norcross, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we moved out here to uh, Lawrenceville just a few years ago. Okay, got it. Got it. So you guys, are, are you from Georgia as well? I am. Okay, so this is just kind of, and Connecticut Valley Arms has always been from Georgia. Uh, well, it was originally from Connecticut. Oh, okay. So and that's then in the, the mid '80s, it was moved. Actually, I think it was probably the early '80s. It was moved uh, into uh, to Norcross, Georgia, mm-hmm. because one of the current owners' wives was from this area and insisted on getting back here, or she was going to leave the then owner in Connecticut. Oh man! <laughs> so, <laughs> so he saw the writing on the wall and moved yeah. the company here to Georgia. Okay, and, it, and it's been here ever since. Awesome. And so uh, underneath BPI, you have CVA, Bergara, Cl- uh, Quake Claw Slings, and Power Belt, and a number of other brands, right? Power, Power Belt Bullets and, and Duracite Scope Mounts. Got it. Yes. And so, uh, and a lot of that stuff has been complementary to the muzzle loading brand for a long time with, you know, slings and the uh, Duracite and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, what has the evolution of BPI and how has that been? In the muzzleloader industry over the last few years, well, as, as you know, the muzzleloading industry changed a lot. When I first started, it was mostly it was still mostly, and th- when I say first started, nineteen ninety five, mm-hmm. still most of our business was in side locks then, mm-hmm. and a lot of it was kit business where a father and son would build a gun together. And in fact, the first muzzleloader I ever had was one of those kit guns. I hate to say it was a Thompson Center, but a, b- a bunch of my friends had had a similar kit gun 
that was called the the uh, St. Louis Hawken from CVA or a CVA mountain rifle. Okay. So amongst the people I hunted with, everybody either had a TC or a CVA. Mm-hmm. And everything was cap lock. Um, and the whole revolution of the modern muzzle loader had really just started. Yeah. And this was when Tony Knight first pioneered the uh, inline style, more modern style gun. Mm-hmm. And as soon as uh, I started with CVA, that's when everything started to transition over. And CVA was getting more and more into uh, the modern, more modern style inlines. And that, of course, was a major disruptive uh, force in the industry. Mm -hmm. And everything over the next few years moved away from the traditional style, true antique replica gun over into the first platform of the modern inline. And then, Mm -hmm. of course, there's been a ton of technological innovation since then. Yeah. And yeah. it's really never slowed down. I mean, you, you've had minor disruptive innovations and then major ones. Mm-hmm. So with every one of those innovations, it's given people a reason to buy a new muzzleloader. Yeah. So it, it's like computers or anything else. They seem to just keep getting better year after year. Yeah, except with muzzleloaders, you can't slow down the old model to make them want to buy a new one. <laughs> well, that's true. And, and, of course, the guns, if you take care of them, they'll last you a lifetime. Yeah. So, you know, what really encourages people is to have a gun that's either easier to load mm-hmm. uh, or to clean or it uh, is more reliable. That's been one of the big things that's driven it. Mm-hmm. And, and then, of course, as of late with uh, the more long-range accuracy-oriented technology that's come yep. down the pike. Yeah. So what were some of those like original CVA inline models from like the early 90s? Back in those days it was a gun called the Apollo. Really? And it was what we would call a straight cock spring-loaded bolt mm-hmm. uh, style muzzle loader. Kind of like the Buckhorn was? Yeah. Okay. The Buckhorn was uh, a later generation of the Apollo. Oh, okay. Exactly. Got it. And then in 1992, um, we introduced the Optima, which was the first really middle price point break action gun. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the Thompson Center Encore preceded it. Uh-huh. And, but it was very, very expensive, so mm-hmm. very few people could afford it. But the thing that the brake action uh, offered was it was much easier to uh, prime the gun because mm-hmm. you could just break the gun open and, and put, the, put the primer cap in there. You didn't have to use a capping tool or anything like that. Just an all-in-all more consumer-friendly design. Mm-hmm. And so we launched the Optima in 2002, and that year our total sales doubled because we were the only company out there that had an affordable brake action, Yeah, which was what, it was what consumers wanted. We mm-hmm. picked up on that, but the Encore was too expensive for most of them yep. to afford it. Yeah. So when we came out with the Optima that was under $300 to start with, yeah. uh, it really just took over the market. Okay. And, and our sales doubled in one year when we introduced that gun. Wow. And then about that, uh, I think it was the same year we introduced Power Belt Bullets. So we had two home runs the same year with Man. those two. And ever since then, um, CVA has been the leading brand in the muzzleloading industry. So we've never turned loose of that number one position mm-hmm. since that 2002-2003 time period. Yeah, well, it shows you the benefit of being being early on the trends, you know, rather than late too. And well, so. well, right, and and of course, you know, a lot of what makes products really successful, you may not be the first to market with the technology, but when you're the first to market with the technology at an affordable price, yeah. it opens it up to the mass market. Yeah. And that's true really of any product category. Yeah. That, that the Model you look T, at. you know, like when cars were first coming exactly. out. Exactly. They yeah. existed, but Ford made them affordable for everybody, yeah, you know, it, and that's it, when they blew yeah, up. Right. And and that was the every man's car. Mm-hmm. And they, by, by using uh, modern manufacturing techniques, mainly with interchangeable parts, mm-hmm. they were able to bring that down to where people could afford it. It was the same way. I mean, we had a very modern factory in Spain. Mm-hmm. And so we were able to produce uh, these guns at, at affordable prices and, and then 
you had another major disruptive innovation to where everybody transitioned from the original style in line over to break action style in lines. Okay. And so for several years, that was really driving our business was that was that whole market turning over because mm-hmm. everyone wanted a break action gun because it was easier to load and clean. Okay. And at what point did CVA, when did you guys like switch from uh, U.S. to like to manufacturing in Spain? Well, early on, as I understand it, this was before my time, but back in the early 70s, uh, the guns, uh, the Connecticut Valley Arms guns were completely made in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And then the present owners uh, found a couple of companies in Spain that were making reproduction guns, and they started buying barrels from those companies. Mm-hmm. And then eventually eventually that changed to where more and more of the product was being sourced from Spain until eventually it went over to where 100% of the manufacturing of the gun itself was taking part in Spain. Okay. And um, you know, like I said back in those days, I mean really the the go-to companies, the pioneers of the modern muzzle loading era which would have started back in the early 70s, really were Thompson mm-hmm. Center and Connecticut Valley Arms. Mm-hmm. But a question I had for you as well is, um, so back in the early 90s when you had these other inlines that were getting introduced, mm-hmm. when did 209 ignition start coming? Was it at the beginning of all that or later? No, it wasn't. I mean, the first inline muzzle loaders used your standard, you may remember the number 11 cap, mm-hmm. which was used in really pretty much all the reproduction muzzle loaders. Uh, and then um, Knight introduced the disc. Mm-hmm. And it used a modern 209 shot shell primer, but it had to be in a little uh, plastic disc that carried it. Okay. So, so th- they started that. And then other companies started looking that, at it. They realized it was a more efficient ignition system but they realized also, as we did, that you didn't necessarily have to have the little plastic disc to mm-hmm. make that work. And so we and some other companies came out with breech plugs that would accept a 209 directly into the breech plug instead of using that uh, the little disc that would carry the 209. Okay. Now, also early on, the 209 uh, ignition, because 209 primer is a component of modern ammunition, Mm -hmm. it wasn't legal in a lot of states. So there was a lot of lobbying that went on back then to make the 209 legal. Mm. So before it could be sold, before you could sell a gun in every state that was 209 compatible, uh, a bunch of laws had to get changed. So that was a several year process as well, but uh, eventually the 209 was legal everywhere as it pretty much is today. Yeah. Um, Except for with the Oregon exception and Idaho. of the Northwest, <laughs> yeah. Where we're, where we're from. So yeah, always always having to keep those restrictions down. Right. Which, it's interesting because a lot of those laws people don't really understand. They're actually um, fought for by the local population, you know, and so sportsmen want to try and keep those laws um, more primitive, which I, I don't necessarily agree with. I think that, you know, having having those things be legal, but having splitting it up, having different seasons like Montana introducing their heritage season. Mm-hmm. If you have a season where you can hunt, I think Pennsylvania is probably the best example of it, where you have a flintlock and an inline season for different types of species. Well, Pennsylvania is a great example. During their buck season, it's still flintlock only. Mm-hmm. And that's really because that's what the people still want. Yes. Or a majority yep. of them, apparently, a majority of them are the ones that have influence with the game department. Mm-hmm. And it is very much a tradition up there, the, yeah. the flintlock buck season. Mm-hmm. A few years ago, they introduced a season where inlines could be used, but it, as I understand it, it was and still is for does only. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's kind of the last holdout. And so you've got one state where there's demand for flintlock. Mm-hmm. What makes me think it might be more game department driven is nowhere else in the United States do we have a high demand for flintlock rifles. Yeah. Other than Pennsylvania. That's true. I mean, you probably have a really interesting insight into that as well, seeing where all these different muzzleloaders have gone over the years, mm-hmm. you know. And so um, it is interesting, like, whenever the Pennsylvania season rolls around, we always see a bunch of guns, a bunch of flintlocks going to Pennsylvania, you know. Um, but, uh, and also, so you guys got away from the sidelock stuff. 
uh, pretty pretty early on, right? Well, we we eventually decided that it wasn't worth because the market was moving so rapidly mm-hmm. uh, towards the in, towards inline style, uh, and we saw this early on as everybody that was buying a more expensive muzzle loader was buying an inline, and so it eventually got to the point to where all of the side lock guns we were selling, we were only selling them because they were inexpensive. Mm-hmm. So what that told us was that everybody wanted an inline because it was easier to clean, more reliable, more accurate, mm-hmm. at least in the terms of that it was easier to mount a scope on. Yeah, uh, It was a more comfortable design for a lot of people because it looked and felt like a bolt action rifle in some cases or a break action center fire. Mm-hmm. And so we just saw that writing on the wall. We had a lot of money invested in woodworking equipment at the factory and all the other equipment necessary to make side lock guns. And, and we just said, hey, our factory space is more valuable mm-hmm. if we devote all that factory space to making the product that, that more people want and more and more people are going to want in the future. Mm-hmm. So we made an early move away from the whole traditional style. You know, even though we certainly love those guns, I mean, I still have an old CVA mountain rifle that I still hunt with that's mm-hmm. a flintlock. So, you know, but it's guys that are real enthusiasts for the traditional side of muzzle loading, mm-hmm. similar to the way it is in archery. You know, you've got a, a core of people that shoot traditional bows, and mm-hmm. then you've got the masses that are going to shoot compounds. Yep. yep. Uh, because most people are looking to take advantage of additional hunting opportunity. Yep. And yep. with muzzle loading, it's even more true than it is with archery. So, you know, if there weren't special muzzle loading seasons, mm-hmm. I doubt if many muzzle loaders would be sold yeah. in the United yep. States. So, so the season and the added hunting opportunity is what makes uh, the demand for muzzle loaders so high. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we see that because North America is really the only place where there's a large uh, demand for muzzle loaders. Mm-hmm. Anywhere else in the world, there's really not much of a demand except for a few enthusiasts. And that's because there's no special muzzle loading seasons yeah. anywhere else in the world. Yeah, and it's interesting that, um, like, the United States, the firearm technology is so tightly linked to our history that I think people gravitate towards that some and so that's why you have these different seasons that pop up Mm -hmm. and then you have different people that kind of fall in line because they want to either increase their season or they're attached to the history part so you kind of have that two branches of muzzleloaders where you have the history people and the people looking to just just love hunting you know correct and you know so the the buckskinner types Mm -hmm. which were really responsible for initiating these seasons Mm -hmm. Uh, as were your traditional archers were yeah. responsible for, I mean, they, those used to be small segments of the hunting population mm-hmm. that want, the, and those guys wanted to do it the hard way. Yeah. And because it was harder to kill a deer with a bow or with a, a gun uh, or with a muzzle loading gun, uh, the game departments didn't feel that it put much any additional pressure on the resource. Mm-hmm. And so they were able to give people more opportunity for recreation by creating these special seasons without having a negative impact on the resource. Totally. And, and that was really how our archery and muzzleloading seasons were born. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Because I, I, I never really gave much thought to how archery seasons came about because I think about muzzleloaders a lot because it's always on the forefront of my mind. But mm-hmm. archery seasons were probably kind of a similar deal. When they first came about. Very, very similar. And they were the model that the muzzle loading clubs and the buckskinner club. And there were a lot of these around when I was a kid. When mm-hmm. I was in Boy Scouts, we'd go to these jamborees and there'd be people throwing hatchets and wearing coonskin hats yep. and shooting muzzle loading pistols and rifles. And we just thought that was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Well, it was those guys that followed the lead of the archers mm-hmm. and had these special seasons established. Totally. Yeah. So... Um, we backtrack a little bit to when you decided to make that move away from traditionals. Did you did you receive much pushback from those buckskinner types in that time? Well, we received a little bit, and for our 25th anniversary, we launched, and we we were well into inlines by that time, but we launched a special edition uh, CVA mountain rifle, which had been the that was our bread and butter mm-hmm. ten years before. And we did it in a special uh, 
uh, maple stock that was beautiful. Did the brown steel on the barrel and, mm-hmm. and everything just, I mean, it really looked like a gun from the mountain, mountain man days. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful gun, beautiful wood. And we took, we'd take it to every show. Now we were selling it in the inlines as well. And people would all, I, I like to tell this t- story. People would come up, the first gun they'd gravitate towards would be that mountain rifle and they'd pick it up and they'd look at it uh-huh. and they would talk about how, what a great looking gun it was and the wood on it. And they'd say, man, this is what, this, this is a real muzzleloader here. Mm-hmm. This is what muzzleloading's supposed to be. Yeah. And yeah. I'd look at them and I'd say, well, can I box one of those up for you, sir? And they'd say, no, I'll take that in line. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a bunch of, a lot of idealists yes. that still yes. want to use inlines. <laughs> well, and, and, there's our, and there's still plenty of those people out there. Look, yeah. I, I'm one of them. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I love shooting the traditional stuff. I like shooting traditional bows Mm -hmm. and so that you know there's people out there it's just that they aren't the majority of the market yeah Yeah. and you know we're 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 in business to sell guns so we have to we need to build the muzzle loading guns that people want to buy Mm -hmm. so with the discontinuing of those traditional muzzle loaders is that kind of what birthed the wolf because people were looking for a lower price point in line even lower than like the optima well, the the Optima came out before the Wolf, mm-hmm. and uh, the Wolf was really a price point Optima. Mm-hmm. So you know, it just didn't have as many more expensive features on it. I mean, still a great gun. It just had a shorter barrel. It had a less expensive stock on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it worked the same way, but we were able to hit a lower price point with that. Uh, and so when when that gun came out, it made it to where really anybody looking to buy an entry-level muzzleloader, which was a lot of people back then, because there were still some states where the seasons were just coming on. Mm -hmm. And so you'd have people, and and the season might only last a week, two weeks at the most, so your average guy was going to get a weekend out of it. Mm -hmm. So he didn't want to go spend $350, $400 on a muzzleloader. Yeah. And so the Wolf was for a lot of people the first muzzle loader they ever owned because they could buy one for $199. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that uh, of the brake actions, that was the first affordable, well, super affordable mm-hmm. brake action. Then yeah. the, and then the Optima was the higher end then. And then eventually we introduced the Acura, which was above. So you had a Best, which was the Acura, the Optima in the middle, and the Wolf was the entry level. And that's those gun model names are still in our line today. Mm-hmm. And the guns are still very similar to what they were then. I mean, we've changed some things on how the actions work. We've changed the breech plug design, so now we have the quick removal breech plug, which that was a big thing, Mm -hmm. not having to have a tool to remove your breech plug. So that's another one of those innovations that made muzzle loading easier for people, Mm -hmm. less intimidating. So in the in the CVA line, the Optima preceded all these other lines. The Optima right? was it was, well, it was the first brake action gun. Uh-huh. Uh The guns you mentioned we mentioned before, the Apollo and the Staghorn, which were a different design gun. They of course preceded the Optima, but the Optima was what really launched us into the brake action business. Mm-hmm. And you have nowadays you have the Paramount line and yes. bolt action stuff and. Back in the day, the the older knights used to be bolt action as well, right? Right. Well, I mean, well, not they weren't bolt action. They they were what we what we mentioned before that spring loaded, like a plunger bolt style, design. Kind of. like a plunge, yeah, plunger yeah. style. And then some guns came along that were bolt action. Remington introduced a gun that was modeled after the Remington seven hundred, which was actually, I believe, built on a seven hundred action. Mm-hmm. And then. Other companies came out with guns that worked like a bolt action. So, you know, they're, uh, they didn't work any better than the plunger style guns, mm-hmm. but people just liked them because it was <laughs> what they were familiar with. Yeah. So we were able to develop these bolt action style uh, firing mechanisms even though it really served no purpose, because the purpose with a bolt action is you're ejecting a spent cartridge and putting a live cartridge in, mm-hmm. whereas this was just to open the breech to reprime it. 
Sure. But it looked and felt like a bolt action. So it felt like people's regular deer rifle. Mm -hmm. That brought more people into it. Yeah. But all that preceded the brake action. And and so so then the brake action comes along in in the early 2000s and most muzzle loaders sold today are brake action. Yes. Yes. And so with with the Paramount um, why why the brake action in that instance? Is there a like some kind of R and D purpose to that? Well, it, it's a bolt action, mm -hmm. and uh, the reason it's bolt action is because you're dealing with much higher pressures because these are what we consider to be a super magnum gun. Mm -hmm. So whereas a uh, your standard char a standard charge in a brake action muzzle loader would be say a hundred grains of propellant, mm -hmm. uh, a magnum charge would be a hundred and fifty. You know people. We'll experiment with things sure. all in between there. Some people still shoot 80 grains. It depends on how much recoil they want, mm -hmm. what kind of distance they're going to be shooting at. Uh, when the Paramount came along, the goal was to be able to load more powder than a standard ma than a Magnum charge, mm -hmm. and uh, there thereby generate more pressure, thereby generate more muzzle velocity. Mm -hmm. which means you get a flatter flying projectile, which means you're not having to deal with as much drop mm -hmm. as you would with a lower velocity projectile. Yeah. Uh, so the whole idea with that was to build a really beefed up gun, mm -hmm. uh, have the bolt action design, which really kind of locks everything in place. Uh, and also that bolt action has a camming uh, design to it so that the face of the bolt cams down over the primer mm -hmm. and keeps any uh, keeps any gas from escaping out the back. Yes. Uh -huh. So that bolt action, instead of it instead of it going up and engaging into like a uh, center fire would, mm -hmm. it's actually going up and engaging over the Vera the, flame the, the Vera flame yeah. primer. Yeah. And of course, that Vera flame it, it uses the Vera flame priming carrier uses a uh, modern uh, rifle primer, mm -hmm. uh, and it's carried inside a stainless steel Veriflame thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the reason for that is you've got so much pressure coming back that a regular 209 couldn't handle that pressure, and it would expand. So, okay. so the whole idea behind the Paramount is it's built to hi handle these higher pressures in the chamber. Got it. Okay, so, and, so that is a reason to use the Veriflame. There's also something to do with the the way that the large rifle primer ignites the powder as well, right? It doesn't uh, displace it, so you Correct. have more like a lower standard deviation. Yeah, you have as you you're, it doesn't push the powder charge forward to the mm -hmm. same degree, so it, it it ignites it without pushing everything forward down the barrel. And if you're using Blackhorn 209, because Blackhorn is more powerful in the same measurement mm -hmm. than say triple seven or pyrodex would be you you can have a shorter powder column mm -hmm. that generates more pressure okay so for example 120 grains in blackhorn is going to generate about the same pressure that 150 grains in pyrodex mm -hmm. so you can use less powder to get the same pressure generation because you're using less powder you don't have as long a powder column mm -hmm. and the big problem was always you know you could load up a bunch of powder but if most of it's getting pushed out the end of the barrel before yeah. it burns it doesn't do any good mm -hmm. so the combination of the vera flame system along with blackhorn powder mm -hmm. and that enabled us to make a gun that would efficiently shoot these hot these more uh these higher pressure producing producing loads. Interesting. See, that's fascinating because I never really even considered the the idea of like the powder column. You know, I always thought that it was just you know for whatever reason that if you had a hotter primer, it would ignite more of the powder. But which probably is true to an extent. But the powder column, how long it takes to burn right. from from start to finish. Yeah. So the ideal thing is to have it igniting more of the column and to have less of a column. Uh huh. And so we. When Blackhorn was in short supply, we'd have people calling us up going, what other powder can I shoot in the Paramount? Well, there was really no other powder that would work well. Mm -hmm. Because if you use 777 or, or Pyrodex, you just wouldn't get the same burn characteristics. You weren't going to produce the same amount of pressure. So the whole reason for owning a Paramount mm -hmm. 
disappears if you can't get the powder. Yeah. If you can't get the because it was built around blackhorn. Mm -hmm. It was built around the qualities of blackhorn. Yeah. So you know that caused us a big problem for the last year or so because blackhorn wasn't re readily available. But apparently it's loosening up now because I'm seeing it on store shelves and I see people on our. Uh, on the various websites that we that we follow, saying that they're finding blackhorn now. Yeah, yeah, it's starting so, to loosen up. So that's that's going to help the Paramount. So totally. You know, um, but I mean, the the Paramount is really the latest in in technology for us. Mm -hmm. And what we did there was similar to what we did with the brake action with the Optima, because there have been guns out there for years that mm -hmm. will shoot out to 400 yards. Yeah. Most of them are custom made uh and they they're going to cost between 4 and $6,000. Mm -hmm. Uh what we did with the parent with the Paramount was we brought that performance down to about $1,000, a little over 1200 mm -hmm. to where a lot more people could afford it. Yeah. Yep. And plus the Paramount is a dedicated muzzle loader so it can be sold uh, through the mail, it can be shipped anywhere. You can buy it without ha having to go through an FFL mm -hmm. to where these other custom long range muzzle loaders are all built on center fire actions. Yeah. So, therefore, legally, they're classified as firearms and you have to go through the uh, necessary paperwork to purchase one. Totally. So, you know, it, it seems like a, a totally different thing, but really, we're just doing the same game plan to mm -hmm. where. You know, we say, okay, here's what consumers want. How do we bring it to them at a price that the mass market can afford? Yeah, and I've I've been very thoroughly impressed with the Paramount. I spent quite a bit of time with the the 40 caliber HDR, and uh, me and Nate, we actually just went out to the range here about a little over a month ago, and we shot it out to a thousand yards and rang some steel out there. And so, I mean, to be able to do that with the muzzle loader is is incredible. Yes. Um, you know, it's awesome, and the performance has just been incredible. So. Um, and when you when you look at that and you compare that to a lot of the other muzzleloaders in your line, it really just kind of speaks to the overall quality of CVAs. Mm -hmm. um, and even like with entry level muzzleloaders like the Wolf, I've been able to get you know one one inch groups with the Wolf. You know, it's great. Well, that's one of the jokes we tell internally about the Wolf is we need to make it not shoot so well. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too good for the price. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Well, I mean, now, you know, granted, you're you're going to be shooting, uh, you know, more reasonable. It's it's never going to be the gun the Paramount is, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really it'll kill deer just as well as an Acura will. Mm -hmm. Granted, the Acura has more features on it. The Acura might be a depending on barrel length, might be a little bit flatter shooting. Longer ranges. But, but yeah, I mean, it's it's like, you know, you can buy a Toyota or you can buy a Lexus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Toyota's still going to get you there. Yeah. But the Lexus gets you there in a little more style. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, it's, and that's, that's one of the things that we've done. I mean, we've done load development. And even with the new Wolf V2, that's you're adding more features to these entry-level muzzle loaders as well. And um, it, I, what I really appreciate about the Wolf V2 and the innovations you made there is the adjustable length of pull with that. Right. Um, because there's, you know, when being a full grown man, I don't really think about length of pull until mm -hmm. I started shooting with my wife and realizing that length right. of pull is a huge issue for people sometimes. So Right. And, and the Wolf is the ideal gun to start a child with mm -hmm. or, or really uh, ladies, especially if they're small framed, mm -hmm. because you can take an inch of that stock out of it and it's got a short barrel. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times if you take a long barrel gun and take an inch of the stock out, it's going to feel front heavy, but, mm -hmm. the, but the wolf is perfect, perfectly balanced either way, Yeah. either yep. with the stock spacer in or without. Mm -hmm. And so you can buy a gun that'll fit the child when he's 10, and then you put the spacer back in and it fits him when he's 14. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So um, going back into the, the early days of CVA, um, you said you started here in 1995. Is that right? Correct. And what was your position here when you first started? I, I started as national sales manager. Okay. Got it. And I, I came out of the athletics business. I'd been in the athletics, uh, so, you know, more what we called socks and jocks, sporting goods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tennis rackets, running shoes, all that kind of stuff, and and moved into the outdoor industry when I took this, made this made this move over uh, 
to, to take the job with, with what was then CVA Incorporated or mm-hmm. Connecticut Valley Arms Incorporated. But it wasn't like I was a newbie to muzzle loading. I'd been doing it since I'd been doing it for years. Yeah. Uh, so my dad and I were always into it. And, and so it was kind of like, boy, here's where I can have a job and it'll involve getting to shoot guns and go hunting. Mm-hmm. And I thought, what could be better than that? <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> it doesn't get much better than that. So, yeah. So, and, so, and so the rest is history. And, and mm-hmm. of course, back then we were a, a very, very small company. All we were into was muzzle loading. Mm-hmm. Uh, muzzle loading has always been a foundation of our business, but uh, several years ago when some states made large caliber single shot centerfire rifles legal mm-hmm. in what had previously been the muzzle loading season, that pushed us into making centerfire single shots. Mm-hmm. So CVA now actually uh, with our uh, scout model, we're the number one single shot centerfire mm-hmm. uh, seller in the country. And have been for for years. And then more recently, about three years ago, we introduced the Cascade Bolt Action. Mm -hmm. So so now we are not just a muzzle-loading company. We are a hunting company. Yeah. So we make muzzle-loaders. We make single-shot centerfire rifles. And we make bolt-action rifles. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of a transition from like a strictly muzzleloader to just that hunting brand where exactly. you have all those different types of things. So. Exactly. And because we are, we're so well known to people in the muzzleloading business and, and then moved on to the single shot center fire, it's been a relatively easy transition for us, even going into bolt action rifles mm-hmm. because people know and respect the brand. They've had good luck with a CVA before, either yeah. with a muzzleloader yeah. or a single shot center fire. So making that step over into a bolt action was pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And the philosophy that we use with the bolt action is the same that we use on muzzleloaders and centerfires, which is if we put a gun on the market, it's going to be the best gun for the money. Mm -hmm. So if it's a a a $200 gun or a $1,000 gun, yeah. It's going to be the best gun for that amount of money. Yeah. That's yeah. what we've always felt was the secret to our success was giving consumers the most value for their dollar. Yeah. Yeah. And I can attest to that with the Cascade as well. I picked one up in 6.5 PRC and my wife killed an elk with it last year. And it's become my main hunting rifle because for the for the price that you pay for it in that price range, I mean, you're not going to find something that's Cerakoted with a threaded barrel with a... 70, 70 degree bolt throw, you know, right. like all these different things. It just kind of adds up and you're like, man, for this price. And then it also, you know, I can shoot at least an MOA, oftentimes under an MOA. And that's probably more to do with me than the gun, you know. Sure, so, sure. Uh, it's very accurate. And of course, we had, you know, we borrowed a lot of, uh, a lot of our expertise from our sister company, Bergara, mm-hmm. which probably eight or nine years ago, just started into the bolt action business and very quickly became one of the top brands. So there were a lot of things that we on the CVA product development side were able to go talk to the Bergara guys and say, hey, how would, how should we do this? How should we do that? Mm-hmm. Granted, our goal was to make a, a less expensive rifle than a Bergara can be mm-hmm. because it's at a such a high level. Uh, but we were able to take a lot of that. At, we were already good at making bolt action rifles before the CVA in the Bergara line before we ever launched the CVA Cascade. Hmm. So when Bergara first started with uh, BPI, was it a similar situation like with Connecticut Valley Arms? Were they a separate, like a like a, uh, a company rather than a brand that was acquired? Well, we um, what, what happened was back when the Optima was introduced, mm-hmm. which we talked about before, our sales took off to a degree that we couldn't get enough quality barrels to build the guns mm-hmm. that we needed to build because we were buying barrels from another source. Like OEM A barrel maker. Stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a, bar- a barrel maker in Spain. And so we decided that to control our own destiny and to make sure that the quality of our product stayed up to our standard, that we needed to be making our own barrels, not relying on someone else to make them. Mm-hmm. So we decided to get into the barrel making business and 
unlike other barrel companies, we were starting from scratch to whereas at that time, most of the barrel makers were using World War II era machinery. Hmm. So we started from scratch and went out and bought the latest high-tech German robotics, drilling machines, honing machines, uh, rifling stuff. And so we ended up, once we started doing that, with with really one of the more advanced barrel-making factories in the world, and that was when we were just making muzzle-loading barrels. Mm-hmm. Well, then the change I talked to you about before, about where centerfire uh, started to become legal, uh, single-shot centerfire in some states, um, and we uh, decided to expand our capability with that because we had extra capacity. So we said, why not start making some centerfire barrels as well? Yeah. So we started making some interchangeable models to where, uh, which was the Optima Pro mm-hmm. back in the day. And the Optima Pro, you could interchange uh, centerfire barrels and muzzle loading barrels. Okay. So that was our first foray into, into centerfire. And then we decided that we could make barrels and sell them OEM. Mm -hmm. So we created uh, Bergara barrels. We bought more machinery. We hired a guy named Ed Schillen, who was legendary in the custom barrel making business in the United States. And we started making barrels for other companies that made very high-end bolt-action rifles. Mm -hmm. So we were the OEM supplier to those companies. At the same time, we were selling Bergara branded drop in barrels for the Remington 700, for the Ruger one, I mean, I'm sorry, for the Savage 110, and for Thompson Center Encore. And what, what year is this all taking this place? This would have been probably in the mid to late, I'd say, I'd say the barrel factory probably came in in about two, was fully functional in about 2004. Mm hmm somewhere in that range. Okay. And the demand for barrels worldwide started to increase. You had some wars kicking up in places, so the military was using more. And so all of a sudden, there was a shortage of barrel capacity worldwide. Mm -hmm. And we were right there ready to expand. And, And so we started filling a lot of that. And companies that had traditionally used only one barrel manufacturer then needed to look for other sources, and we were there as the source. So we mm-hmm. got a jump start, and Bergara Barrels was born. Yeah. So we were selling Bergara Barrels before we ever sold a Bergara rifle. And these premium barrels that were branded Bergara were used on the higher-end CVA rifles. So the Acura and the Apex, mm-hmm. and the Apex, you may recall, was another yeah. interchangeable centerfire muzzle-loading platform. And uh, so here we were making barrels for other very high-reputation gun makers. We were having great success with making the drop-in barrels that we would sell to consumers and to gunsmiths. And one day we said, you know, if we're making barrels for company X, mm-hmm. which is one of the highest reputed company bar- uh, rifle makers in the world, why can't we be making our own rifles? Yeah. Yep. So we, we started out, uh, at first Bergara was just a custom rifle maker, and then that expanded into custom quality production rifles, which then expanded into production rifles for the mass market. Okay. And then the the relationship between Bergara and CVA was kind of just stemmed from that, and you start having Bergara right. barrels with the right. Acuras. The, and that the barrels of... came out of the same factory. Got it. Which was owned by yep. our parent company. Okay. Even though a lot of the Bergara rifles were made here in the U.S. at our facility here in the United States. Okay. Awesome. And initially, we hired a bunch of guys from the Marine Corps Special Weapons Section mm-hmm. who design all the sniper, who build all the sniper rifles for the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. Well, we brought one of those guys by the name of Dan Hannes out of there. Then he recruited other people that had worked for him. And as they retired, these former Marine Corps Special Weapons guys were here working for the Bergara brand. Mm-hmm. 
And that was a key component as well to yeah. bringing those things up. But I mean, as far as product development is concerned, for the most part, there's been kind of a wall between the Bergara. Bergara is a sister company of uh, ours. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not that we won't share information. It's just that we're developing, you know, products that are designed for a different type of consumer. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Center fire people versus muzzleloader people. Right. Yeah. And and Bergara tended to be a, a very precision oriented. Uh, so, so you've got long-range uh, target rifles in that line. You, we sell uh, Bergara sells rifles to police forces mm-hmm. as sniper rifles, and then of course they sell a lot of the higher, a lot of higher-end hunting rifles as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in CVA, we're really focused more so on the pure hunter mm-hmm. than the pure shooter. Got it. Okay. So yeah, Bergara yeah. is more not not that some hunters aren't great shooters, but guys that are shooters uh, are are you are usually hunters and shooters. Some people are yeah. just hunters. Yeah. They want a gun that they can depend on. They can go out, you know, which of course CVA fit that bill for years in the muzzle loader, uh, and our center fires in the CVA brand fit fit that bill the same. I mean, mm-hmm. they want to go out and buy a functional gun for a reasonable price that they can go out and be successful hunting with. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it requires a different level. If you're shooting, if you're trying to hit a three MOA target at a thousand yards, it's a different Correct. level of thing than you're, if you're trying yeah. to shoot a deer at 300. Right. And, and that's not the consumer we're after with the CVA brand. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so in muzzle loading, um, you're talking about the difference, like the different splashes that have been made across like we have the first inline like the mk85 that came out Mm -hmm. um and then i think recently we've kind of seen some of that with uh like the paramounts and these these extra long extreme long range muzzle loaders as well um and it's it's cool to kind of see how things get shaken up and see where things settle out and uh you know where where do you think that the paramount kind of lands with those things like what kind of consumer is going to be looking for the paramount well, I, I think it'll be like other innovations that we've seen with a certain segment of the market. So probably anybody that's hunting out west mm-hmm. during a muzzleloader season right now is seriously considering a paramount. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the east, where you're unlikely to ever get a shot beyond 100 yards during the muzzleloading season, that shooter may not need the capabilities mm-hmm. of a Paramount. Yeah. And, and the Paramount is a little bit heavier rifle, and, you know, it takes more effort to get the most out of it because you're measuring powder charges. Everything has to be precise. Uh, so it's not just to drop a couple of pellets down the barrel and push a projectile down and go out and shoot something. Yeah. I, yep. mean, I mean, there's a lot more involved with it than that. Guys that are hunting elk or antelope or mule deer out west during the muzzleloading seasons, and they they know that they can get within 400 yards, Mm -hmm. but it's closing that next 200 yards with a typical muzzleloader that's going to be difficult. Yep. Um, if they learn how to use the paramount, they can make that killing shot at 300 or even sometimes 400 yards. 300, we really consider that to be a chip shot with the paramount. Yeah. Yep. Uh, with a standard muzzle loader, that's an extremely long shot. Yeah. You know, t- 200 yep. yards is even pushing it with a standard muzzle loader. Yeah. Because the drops are so extreme, you mm-hmm. you really have to know that gun. Yeah. What the Paramount takes out of that equation, it's it's so flat shooting. Really, it's about it's as flat shooting as say a thirty out six, and you know, so you're not having to make those major adjustments. There's still some adjustments you have to make, and you need to know where that bullet's going to go. You need to know how far it is to your target. Yeah. But you're not looking at a twenty foot drop mm-hmm. like you would be. Yeah. <laughs> possibly with a standard charged muzzle loader. Yeah, of yeah. the old days. I I was uh, during bear season. I used a CVA Acura LRX, mm-hmm. and I I put a lot of time behind it. And even in so doing, with the fifty caliber, it was pretty tough at three hundred yards. So I was like, man, I need to make sure I know my wind. Your wind is crucial at that yeah. distance. You know, there's so many variables when you're moving, uh, when there's so much drop. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the Paramount, three hundred yards is, is ah. it lights out. You know, yeah. so. Yeah, and and I mean you you know it's only going to drop what is it twenty two inches in the forty five cal? Mm-hmm. No, maybe it's twenty eight. I think it's twenty eight at three hundred. Yeah, forty five. That's manageable. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. And when we talk about the evolution of like the muzzleloaders and and the Paramount specifically, mm-hmm. I kind of want to talk about the evolution of muzzleloader projectiles as well because Power Belt has evolved right alongside all these different uh, muzzleloaders. And, um, you know, you see when you guys first acquired it, it was Black Belt, right? Uh, well, yes. Black Belt was the, the bullets, the same design bullets, mm-hmm. the basic bullet that first came out was first marketed under Black Belt. And a guy named Michael McMichael ran that company. Mm-hmm. And he literally was driving, I can't remember what beat up, I think it was like a... The Geo Metro or something. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> I think it was a Geo Metro. He had that thing loaded down with uh, lead and he was traveling around the country trying to go into shops and sell these bullets mm-hmm. to these, just out of the trunk of his car. Yeah. Yep. And was building them all in his garage. And we met him somewhere, and we got some of his bullets and shot them in our rifles, and they were the best bullets we'd ever shot. Wow. Back then, there were sabots, sabotated bullets, Mm -hmm. or sabos. Yeah. And there were pure lead conicals. Mm -hmm. And the pure lead conical was fairly easy to load. And the the sabos were very difficult to load. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, to the point where you had to clean the barrel to be able to get another char another bullet down the barrel. Yeah. So you had the pure lead conicals that were easy to load, but certainly they weren't precision. Mm-hmm. But most people weren't shooting more than a hundred yards then anyway. That was considered a long shot. Yeah. And and then you had the sabos on the other side. And the power belt we discovered was easy to load, and it gave you the great performance that you would that you would get out of the sabotaged bullets, except it was more user friendly. Mm-hmm. Uh, still created the gas seal, but it didn't leave all the plastic fouling behind in the barrel. So we saw some potential there, and we cut a deal with Michael McMichael that we would be his exclusive distributor. Mm-hmm. that he would only sell that bullet to us and we would only buy those bullets from him. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I I believe we inked that deal in 2002. Mm-hmm. And Power Belt went on and, and it didn't take it long before it was the number one selling muzzle-loading projectile on the market. Yeah. And still maintains that position. Mm-hmm. And several of our largest retailers will tell us that they sell more power belt than they do all other muzzle loading projectiles combined. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's a very dominant player out there. And of course, we've made te- uh, technical advances with that. Michael's company has come up with, with new designs over the years, like the Aero Light. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we first started, there were only hollow points and solid points. And then we had the ballistic tip mm-hmm. uh, design uh, in the arrow tip. Yeah. And then most recently the ELR, which is the uh, extended long range, and that bullet was developed in conjunction with the Paramount. So we wanted to have, uh, the Paramount was really a combination of we had to have a new ignition system, we had to use a special type of propellant, Mm-hmm. We had to have a special type of action that would seal up the the uh, flash hole. Yeah. And then we also needed a projectile that could handle the pressures that were being uh, generated. So we wanted to have a longer projectile that would give us a better BC. And so as we were developing the Paramount, at the same time we were working with the guys that make the power belt to develop the ELR bullet. Mm-hmm. So the Paramount ended up being a system. You know, it's not like you can go out and just, I mean, there's other bullets that will perform well in it, but it, it's a lot more finicky. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, you had to have the right powder. You had to use a Vera Flame ignition instead of a 209 ignition. You had to have the bolt action to lock everything down. And once you brought all those variables together, then you had a gun that would do what we wanted the gun to do. So the Paramount is almost like a, like a, a Ferrari, like a high precision, where you ha- you can't just throw any sort of thing in it. Right. It performs extremely well with a certain set yeah. of, of things surrounding it, you know. Yeah, I mean, we have people ask us, you know, why do you market a gun that will only use one type of propellant? Mm. And we say, well, 
you know, it, it's a race car. It needs race car fuel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it and it's not going to perform well, you know, with yeah. with uh, eighty seven octane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, but yeah, and we discussed that before. That was a real fresh. When you lose one of those components, it shuts everything down. Yeah. And we even had to limit our production of the Paramount because there just wasn't enough powder out there, and we didn't want to make make people upset. Mm-hmm. And so we we actually cut production of the Paramount in twenty twenty two. Because we knew that there wouldn't be the propellant out there. Yep. Um, and next year, it looks like it's, or so we're hearing, that it should be more available. Yeah. But we tell people right up front, you know, before you buy the gun, find your Blackhorn mm-hmm. p- propellant. And it, then, then you won't have the problems. Because we had people that were mad at us. Yeah. They yeah. bought the gun, then they couldn't buy, they couldn't find the propellant, and they wanted to send the gun back. Hmm. Luckily, very few people did that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but and, and I certainly understand their frustration. But li- like I said, I mean, I was in a in a retailer just the other day, and I saw Blackhorn actually on the shelf. And I yeah. think it's been about two years since I've seen Blackhorn just sitting on the shelf. So yeah. that's a good sign. Yeah, it seems like people aren't paying two hundred fifty dollars for a ten ounce container anymore, and that <laughs> sort of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah, the craziness. I mean, that kind of brings up a whole nother thing of, of COVID and how, how CVA kind of worked through all that stuff. Um, and now we're kind of coming out the other side of that. But how did that affect your guys' production and all that kind of thing? Well, that was an interesting situation because when COVID first started, I remember sitting down with the guy who had taken over as CEO for me. And, mm-hmm. and we were sitting there talking about how is this going to negatively impact our business? Mm-hmm. Well, I had seen no decline in sales bookings. And so the question was, should we cut back on our production? You know, mm-hmm. because everybody thought the world was going to come to an end with COVID. They yeah, thought yep. sales of everything was going to draw to a, a halt. What happened, however, was that any activity that got people out away from other people experienced a boom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the outdoor industry all the way across, I mean, be it fishing, be it camping, hunting, all of that went up. Mm-hmm. So we actually saw a dramatic increase in sales because of COVID, because more people were do it. They weren't going to football games. They weren't going to movies. What could they do? Yeah. Well, they could go out with their family and they could go deer hunting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or they could go out and they could shoot targets. You know, there, there, there were just other things they could do. So that came kind of as a surprise, mm-hmm. a pleasant surprise. However, at the same time, you had supply chain situations that were negatively affecting our ability to build more guns to take advantage of the, of the uh, increased demand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so back in 2021, we weren't able to ship near as much product as mm-hmm. we sold uh, because we were selling more. And we, were, we weren't able to build anymore because of the slowdown in the availability of raw material. You had workers that were out. Yeah. So everything mm-hmm. as far as our production capacity was under pressure to go down, whereas our demand was going up. Yeah. Yep. So it became kind of frustrating. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> and I know you guys experienced the same thing <laughs> because you were on the other end of it because you, you needed more of our muzzle loaders because you had demand for them. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, and we couldn't get them to you. Yeah. And that was the tough thing. I mean, and I don't think it was even isolated, like you're saying, to muzzle loaders or anything. I mean, you see the like bicycles, like you oh, couldn't find a bike, you couldn't find went anything. Up. Yes, you know? exactly. And it's just, it's crazy. And it's nice to see now we're, it seems like we're coming out of the other side, but we're almost going back into something else where things are now, they're available, but now they're really expensive, you know? True. And, and the, everybody's predicting we're going to get back to the a normal. Mm-hmm. I don't think the normal will be, it'll be a new normal. It won't be the same normal. I think a lot of people that got back into or got into outdoor sports because of COVID are going to stick with it. Yep. So I think, you know, because we'd heard a lot of talk years ago about how every year fewer and fewer hunting licenses have been sold. Yep. Well, I think the last couple of years that's gone up. Yeah. For, yep. And that's the first time that curve's gone up in 20 years. Which I mean, I think that's good for 
that's good not just for our industry, but I think it's good for humanity. Like I think people, more people should be hunting, you know, and experiencing the outdoors sure. and sure. getting out away from video games and phones and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean, I th- certainly all of us in the industry hope it's a trend that continues, but I agree with you. I think it would be, uh, you know, g- good for everyone mm-hmm. to get a little bit more of a connection with the natural world instead of being so tied up in the virtual world. Yeah, yep. But, and it's tough because you see, I mean, we're making podcasts right now and just our world has become so virtual. Mm-hmm. You know, it's how business is done. And it's tough to get away from that. But hunting is really a good, and I think muzzleloading, you know, to bring it all back to that. Muzzle loading is a really awesome like escape from that virtual world that's so right. unnatural and foreign. Right, and another thing that's been working in our favor is the uh, is is the trend towards people wanting healthier food. Mm-hmm. So you know, I think you've seen a lot of people get into hunting. You know, more people that possibly weren't raised hunting. But they're getting into it because they know that that venison is going to be healthy meat. It's not genetically modified. Yep. And so, so there's been that movement there that I think has helped us. Certainly, more women have been getting involved in hunting yep. than ever before. So, you know, there's just a lot of trends that are working in our favor, and I, and I think they're going to uh, survive beyond this this COVID thing, even though a lot of it was inspired by it. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's going to be good that comes out of it. As as well as the bad that came with it, but um, yeah, I really I really appreciate you sitting down with me today. It's been I, my pleasure. I, I really enjoy enjoyed it. hearing about CVA. A lot of the stuff I haven't I didn't know, you know, because I'm pretty familiar with CVA in the time that I've been working at muzzleloaders.com. But prior to that, a lot of those things were just kind of lost in the history of it. So um, I think that our listeners will really enjoy it, and I really appreciate you taking the time. So my pleasure, and we appreciate everything you guys do for us. It's our pleasure. So thanks so much, Dudley. Often. We'll talk to you later. Uh, For you guys listening, thank you so much. And um, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Or leave a review if you're listening on Spotify or iTunes or whatever that is. It's going to help our show out a lot. We appreciate it. Let us know what kind of content you want to see. And we'll see you on the next episode.